Y'all welcome to our beautiful state house once again. It's with a great pleasure that I am able to announce today the appointment of a new Inspector General. He is Brian Lamkin of Blythewood. This is his son, Jonathan. Mr. Lamkin also has two daughters, Christina Shapiro, who's married with two children, lives in Virginia. Another daughter, Lauren Bailey, also married with two children, lives in Columbia. Four children, lives in Columbia. Four children, and, and Jonathan is his fourth year of engineering at Georgia Tech. That's a good school, too. They haven't won any championships lately, but it's a good school, good school. Uh, uh, Brian Lampkin is a familiar face, or should be, because he's been acting as Inspector General since Mr. Maley left, and he's been working there as a, an investigator for four years. Uh, this is not an ordinary man. M Mr. Lampkin is a 25-year veteran of the FBI. He was the assistant director of the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia. He's a senior agent in charge of the National Law Enforcement Training Programs, and he was a special agent in charge in Atlanta and Columbia. In FBI terms, they, they call that the, the SAC. And in my time as a prosecutor, I've had a lot of experience with the FBI, uh, both in other states as well as this one, and, and their tops. Their training is superb, their insights are are deep in the understanding of how things work and how in investigations should proceed is, is uh, spectacular. So to have a man of, of this, this background who's willing to serve the state uh, is good news for the state. As you know, the Inspector General's office and powers are created by statute. His purpose is to address allegations, if any, of fraud, waste, abuse, mismanagement, misconduct, and, and wrongdoing in the executive branch. And as you know, the executive branch is a big branch of government here. We have 106 separate agencies, 58,000 employees with a budget of $20 billion. And all this is covered by the code. What I have asked Mr. Lamkin to do in the course of his normal investigations with his staff of complaints and questions is to always make every effort to direct the existing agencies towards the direction of transparency. That is, that fully comply with all rules, regulations, and common sense concerning transparency, that is, openness to the public. We believe in public disclosure. We believe in responsiveness to Freedom of Information Act requests and all statutorily mandated reporting and customer service. So this is, this is a good man. He's experienced. He knows South Carolina well. I know he'll be an excellent job, do an excellent job, and he's supported by a fine family and wife, Priscilla. Mm -hmm. And here is Mr. Lamkin. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you, Governor McMaster. I appreciate the, uh, uh, the invitation uh, to serve as your Inspector General. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm very humbled by it because I have an unbelievable staff of experienced investigators, auditors, uh, accountants, and program uh, reviewers uh, that will continue the same path forward that my predecessor, Pat Maley, started and, and built the Inspector General's office around for that independence and ob objectivity of, of what we do um, as the Inspector General. Thank you. And what, what I in, in, intend is for our Inspector General and other staff members to, to start with, with the agencies that report directly to the Governor's office and to have, pay courtesy calls there, make inquiries, and take a look and see if things are working there as smoothly as they could be. And in the normal course of investigations, we'll be doing that uh, throughout the government. Anyone have any questions? We, we have current reviews underway, but none that I can uh, speak about at this point. How big is your staff? We have seven total. And those are seven investigators? Uh, investigators, auditors, um, that includes myself as well. So, I mean, I, I will carry a caseload as well to help in that process. Governor, you said how big has the, how wide has the, the Beg your pardon. 
If it needs to be, we'll make it bigger, but we have a superior staff and excellent leadership, and we have high confidence in the Inspector General. I don't have that. I don't have that number at offhand. We normally will receive somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 to 600 complaints just off the hotline each year, and not every one of those uh, turns into an investigation because many of them don't even apply. Um, we're just authorized through for the executive branch reviews, and what we try to do is take on those reviews and investigations that will have a statewide impact for across all the agencies, not just one one particular agency as well. So. Any more? <clears throat> Thank you for coming. Have a nice day. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, John. Okay. Yes, ma'am. This. They can have some. I have some serious uh, questions about the pension bill, and uh, we'll take a good look at it. Um, as, as the legislature ran back this week, are you urging the Senate to do anything particular in terms of roads and debate? How are you communicating? I would like for them to follow the recommendation that I've made, which is a way to have money go to the roads immediately by substituting the expenditure of the bond that is being discussed, the, the, the monies that would be raised there to go directly to the roads, which are our number one problem. Everybody agrees with that. Instead of going to something else, we need to reform the commission. We need to have a plan, a steady plan on how we're going to approach the construction and the repair of roads in the state. We don't have it now. We need to have priorities. Uh, we need to make a lot of improvements. We need to have reform, but um, I am uh, raising taxes is not the answer. Ra raising taxes is rarely the answer. Raising taxes pushes some people underwater, some that are on fixed income, young people trying to come up, small businesses that are barely hanging on. They spend a lot of money on gas, and we don't, we don't need to be increasing taxes. On those, on those people. We, the money that comes in now from our highway, uh, the gas tax, at least 25%, some say as much as almost half, go to think, half of that money, the 636 million, goes to things other than highways. If we just spent all of the money that comes in on the present gas tax on maintaining the highways, we wouldn't need to raise taxes at all. We, we misdistribute as much money as the new tax is being proposed would raise. So we need we need a lot of we need a lot of reform. Some of the money that you mentioned is to pay for salaries. That's right. If the DOT were to pay for salaries on the general fund, what should be cut? You don't have to cut anything. What we, what what my plan is is to is to gradually shift those expenditures over so that the gas tax that the people of South Carolina pay goes directly to the roads and only to the roads. It only makes common sense. It'd take a little time to do it, but with this using this money that I've proposed as a temporary measure to get us started on the roads, we could do it with, we could do it uh, comfortably. But what, what concerns me is uh, here we are at the end of another legislative session and, and this is a conservative state. Yet we, we, have, we keep continually talking about borrowing money and raising money, raising taxes. We, we ought not to be going in that direction. That's not the way to prosperity. Uh, you cannot tax yourself into prosperity. So I'm opposed to raising this gas tax. Can you say in a real general sense what you're concerned about? We need to have a new way of providing for these pensions and we cannot continually put more and more of the expense on the on the taxpayers uh, you remember the, the case in in Flint Michigan where they couldn't fix the pipes under the city that's that's a, a recent example of about a year ago that was caused because all of the tax money coming into the city was having to go into the pension plan because that's the way they'd set it up we, we cannot build a 
a solid pension plan for the future that is based on the taxpayers always having to bail the system out. We must have a new plan, whether it's a 401k type plan or something else, but uh, the, the, the systems around the country that are working well have the employees and the taxpayers paying uh, roughly the same amount, or, or certainly the, the taxpayers do not pay more than the employees. It took us a while to get into this situation. It's going to take a while to get out. But we have to have a, a different approach. There's a bill in the Senate subcommittee that would require elected officials who commit felonies in office uh, to pay for the cost of the special elections to replace them. Where do you stand on that? Well, I, th I think we need to keep thinking on that because there are a lot of other things that would happen to cause a special election, such as a, uh, a premature death, or, or an accident, a uh, someone running for a different office that, that comes open, and those sorts of things. And uh, if you're going to require one to pay for the election, how, how about uh, how about the other? How about if someone say is a member of the House or the Senate and they run for one for for Congress to they have to pay for that special election. I think we need to be careful on some of these uh, proposals and look at their broad implica implications, although that their um, limited implications uh, sound uh, pretty, pretty justified. But we have to always take the long view, and that's what we need to do with taxes, that's what we need to do with this pension fund, is take the long view. We, we, we got a long time to live in South Carolina, and we've got to take good care of, of what's been given to us and we cannot keep taxing our people more and more, nor can we ask the, the taxpayers to pick up burdens that uh, don't belong to them. That's it. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much.